Tonight we, we have what uh, a lot of us think is a most interesting topic. Uh, it's the continuing relevance of the U.S. deterrent. And so often, of course, we're absolutely immersed in the, the uh, preoccupations of the moment, uh, whether it be particular issues or whether it be geographic areas. And this council has always tried to geographically cover the waterfront. You never know what's going to happen and uh, do the same with issues. And certainly uh, today's topic is one of continuing interest and the topic, it's, uh, the, the title of the remarks uh, is a reminder of the uh, continuing relevance. Our, our guest is uh, uh, one of the nation's really foremost authority, uh, uh, authorities on, on this particular question, in fact, on defense issues in general. Uh, if I may very briefly, his career is uh, interesting and ongoing. Uh, he's a graduate of Williams College, Phi Beta Kappa, uh, an institution for which many of us have enormous respect. In fact, the nation does, I think. And uh, served in the United States Navy as an officer for three years after graduation. Uh, received his uh, Master of Public Affairs from the uh, Woodrow Wilson School at uh, Princeton. And, uh, and then for a long period of time, served the United States in various government agencies. 22 years in the Department of Defense, two years at state, and four years on the National Security Council. Uh, when he retired from that, he joined the uh, Cohen Group, uh, former Secretary of Defense, of course, for five years, and in 1910 joined the Scowcroft Group, where he is today. Uh, what did I say? Did, did I creep back into the last century again? That, that was a nicer era, but it, it better was. In any case, 2010 until the present with the Scowcroft Group. Um, Scowcroft himself is a fascinating personality, of course, and uh, which I had the pleasure of hearing about for a couple of seconds anyway before we began. The, uh, the topics which uh, Mr. Miller has uh, been responsible for and the issues are multitudinous within the defense area, but there certainly has been an em emphasis upon deterrence theory, and he's given credit for being very influential in uh, the development of our deterrence theory and in nuclear targeting, which goes along with it. Uh, he uh, has worked on this not only in the Department of Defense in a number of positions. He's also chaired NATO committees on these same questions. Uh, I won't list the various areas that he's been active in. I should note, though, uh, the recognition that he's been given for his excellence in these areas. He's gotten the Department of Defense's highest civilian award five times, really six as it turns out, in effect. He's uh, received uh, high awards from the Department of State, uh, from the National uh, Nuclear uh, Security Association, from the, chair the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, the Defense, uh, National Defense Institute. Um, and he currently is uh, continuing to be active in a number of national establishments uh, which pay the most serious of attention to these questions. Uh, so simply recognizing uh, the distinction of the authority we have with us tonight, it's my great pleasure to present to you the Honorable Franklin C. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Bird, and, and thank you all of you for uh, spending your time this evening with me to hear about a subject which is often overlooked. Um, it is indeed for me a real honor and a, a pleasure to be here to speak to this distinguished audience. It's an important time to discuss uh, the nation's nuclear deterrent. Our modernization programs are lagging and the very need for an effective U.S. nuclear deterrent is being questioned in some quarters in Washington. You may have seen a publication which uh, was released sometime this summer, um, which had a few retired generals and, and diplomats, um, which actually questioned the need for the deterrent. So let me begin at the beginning by discussing 
why we need a deterrent in the first place. Nuclear weapons will continue to influence global affairs for the foreseeable future. And as a result, the United States, to protect our vital interests and those of our allies, and to moderate great power behavior, will need to continue to have an effective and viable strategic nuclear deterrent capability. It's recently been in vogue in some circles in the nation's capital to assert, and I quote, the risk of nuclear confrontation with either Russia or China belongs to the past, not the future. And quote, a large-scale conflict with Russia or China is implausible or it seems increasingly improbable that the U.S. relations with China or Russia would deteriorate so severely in the next 10 years that the nuclear balance would become a salient factor. Well, those are pretty bold predictions. The danger of making bold predictions can be summed up by what Neville Chamberlain said when he returned from the 1938 Munich Conference. Herr Hitler has assured me he has no further territorial ambitions in Europe. And the trouble with pronouncements like those is that they tend to reflect our aspirations and hopes, not what other capitals are saying and indeed what they are doing. And those capitals have made fairly clear that they believe nuclear weapons are important tools in their diplomatic and military arsenal. No other nuclear weapons state on this planet has embraced the American and British desire to, quote, reduce the role of nuclear weapons, close quote. In fact, quite the opposite has happened. In Russia, the role played by nuclear weapons has increased dramatically. Nuclear weapons are now at the very heart of Russian national security policy. The public statements of the most senior Russian officials, the president, the prime minister, the defense minister, and the chief of the general staff routinely threaten nuclear weapons use against Russia's neighbors. And just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I'm sorry, the chief of the general staff, General Makarov, asserted that Russia might use nuclear weapons preemptively if NATO builds ballistic missile defense sites. Russian policy states that NATO is an enemy. Russian exercises feature simulated nuclear strikes against NATO borders, NATO countries bordering on Russia, and Russian strategic bombers are routinely violating U.S., British, Norwegian, and Japanese airspace as a matter of national policy. The Russians are now building and deploying two new types of submarine launch ballistic missiles, a new class of strategic missile submarine, a new type of intercontinental ballistic missile, and they are working on a new bomber and a new long-range nuclear-tipped cruise missile. The Russian government is even contemplating building a second new type of intercontinental ballistic missile, a giant Cold War throwback to the heavy ICBM class. Now, am I suggesting to you that a new Cold War has begun? No. No. Am I suggesting that the Russian government uses its nuclear arsenal to intimidate its neighbors? Absolutely right. Yes. And do I think that Moscow has accepted the notions that nuclear weapons should have a reduced role? Hardly. The Chinese government refuses to engage in any discussion of its nuclear policy, maintaining a total opacity except for making the operationally empty statement that it has a no first use policy. That of course is meaningless since such a policy can be changed literally in an instant by the Central Committee. China also is deploying new weapons types, two new types of land-based long-range missiles. It's building a new class of missile submarine and a new sea launch ballistic missile, and it refuses to accept any limits on the growth of its nuclear forces. Reduced role? Hardly. This leads to the point, and this is an important point, that it is an enormous conceit and the height of intellectual arrogance to believe that because some Americans may believe some policy goal to be desirable, other countries' leaders with extremely different values and with their own interpretation of their national interests will also believe the same thing. In this case, it should be obvious that they do not. 
And as a result, the United States must maintain a strong, viable, and effective nuclear deterrent to prevent the other great powers from believing that they can threaten us or our allies with nuclear attack or blackmail or conventional attack. Now, are nuclear weapons an all-purpose deterrent? Of course not. Of course not. Nuclear weapons are not, never have been, and never will be an all-purpose deterrent. They are not useful for deterring terrorism, even weapons of mass destruction terrorism by stateless entities. They're not useful for deterring piracy or cross-border drug trafficking or even low-level insurgencies. They won't be useful in helping the free Syrian forces overthrow Assad. They are arguably of marginal value in deterring all but the most catastrophic cyber attacks or attacks against our space assets. And it is a cheap rhetorical trick to suggest that nuclear weapons have outlived their usefulness by pointing out that they failed to deter attacks that they were never intended or deployed to prevent. So when you read recently sentences like, quote, no sensible argument has been put forward for using nuclear weapons to solve any of the major 21st century problems we face, threats posed by regional conflicts, terrorism, cyber warfare, organized crime, drug trafficking, mass migration of refugees, epidemics, or climate change, close quote, or quote, 9-11 exposed the irrelevance of nuclear forces in dealing with 21st century threats, close quote. I urge you to recognize these and reject them for what they are, cheap rhetorical tricks. To meet the new threats of the 21st century, which are very real and much must be deterred or defeated and destroyed, the United States must continue to rely on and to modernize our conventional forces, our ballistic missile defenses, our special operations forces, and our space and cyber capabilities. And I urge you to remember that nuclear weapons were not, to serve, were not designed to serve this role, and they can't. They can, however, prevent the big war. They can allow us to use our other tailored capabilities to deal with more proximate and daily threats, threats which are, in fact, more proximate and daily precisely because nuclear deterrence has made the threat of great power conflict less proximate. And while I'm on policy topics, there are two other myths currently in vogue which I'd like to destroy. The first concerns our allies. You may have heard it said, quote, non-nuclear forces are far more credible instruments for providing 21st century reassurance to allies whose comfort zone in the 20th century resided under the U.S. nuclear umbrella, close quote. Well, clearly some American philosophers believe so, but our allies do not. And try as the philosophers might, and they have done so mightily over the last three years, our allies still make clear that they want the reassurance provided by our nuclear umbrella. This is still the case in Asia, and it is still the case in NATO, where twice in the last three years, the leaders of the alliance have reaffirmed this. And speaking of NATO, consider this remarkable set of statements made in the publication I spoke about earlier. Quote, the military utility of U.S. tactical nuclear weapons in Europe is practically nil. They remain today deployed only for political reasons within the NATO alliance. Well, imagine that shockwave. Nuclear weapons are political weapons. To some, apparently, it's now a bad thing for our nuclear weapons to reassure allies, persuade them that they do not need to develop nuclear weapons of their own, and to ensure that Moscow understands that an attack on NATO would trigger a nuclear response. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. Nuclear weapons have always been political weapons, weapons of war prevention. And that, ladies and gentlemen, also remains a very good thing. And speaking of proliferation, we are also told ad nauseum <coughs> that our nuclear weapons, our nuclear weapons, are contributing to the threat of nuclear proliferation. I've already noted how our nuclear arsenal is in fact an anti-proliferant because we protect allies who otherwise might and could build their own nuclear weapons. But it is important to recognize that the often discussed linkage between the continued existence of the arsenals of the nuclear weapon states and further nuclear proliferation 
simply does not exist. The history of the last 20 years is that the U.S., British, French, and Russian nuclear arsenals have declined dramatically in the last 20 years, while over the same period of time, the Chinese, Indian, Pakistani, and North Korean arsenals have grown. North Korea has not pursued a nuclear program because of our nuclear arsenal. It has pursued one because it seeks to intimidate its neighbors and to, and to deter U.S. conventional military action. And the same holds true for Iran. While the continued existence of the nuclear weapon states' arsenals makes for a convenient talking point in international and domestic nonproliferation circles, it's factually wrong and it's intellectually patronizing to believe that proliferant governments are mindlessly aping P5 policies. So nuclear weapons are going to be around for a long time, and they will continue to play a significant role in war prevention, in deterring major conventional aggression, and in moderating great power interaction. The question now before us is how to structure our nuclear forces in the future to continue to carry out this vital task. The U.S. nuclear triad, so-called, of land-based ICBMs, submarine-based SLBMs, and heavy bombers is a deterrent force which for five decades has provided a survivable and manifestly capable deterrent. And while its birth as a coordinated and combined deterrent force was absolutely unintentional, because in fact it was the product of inter-service rivalry, the triad has shown in its combination of alert status basing modes, delivery systems, and warhead types to provide an overall capability which ensures that no enemy attack could prevent effective U.S. retaliation. The force's multiple basing modes ensure that an enemy attack could not destroy our retaliatory capability with one shot. The multiplicity of warheads and delivery systems ensure that no single technical failure, however serious, could negate our capability to respond. <laughs> The combination of different land-based and sea-based missile azimuths complicated and defeated a potential enemy's attempts to defend against our fast-flying deterrent. And our bombers have provided every president since Harry Truman an ability to signal resolve and determination in a crisis. But what of the future force? In essence, the triad has been modernized twice, in the early 60s by the Kennedy administration and in the 1980s by the Reagan administration. But that, in fact, was a long time ago. All of the triad systems will require significant modernization or replacement in the next two decades, or they will be lost to history. Let me repeat that. Absent modernization, we will not have a nuclear deterrent in a few decades. Have the policy and strategy requirements for having a triad changed? Some would have you think so. Again. It is in vogue in some circles in Washington to, to suggest that we should eliminate the land-based missile force and remove the submarines from alert status, indeed to make the submarines incapable of responding for up to 72 hours. Now, what's wrong with this picture? First, under the current force, any Russian leadership in a future crisis, and remember we're not talking about this from a bolt from the blue posture today, but in a hugely dangerous future crisis, in which the use of military force is being contemplated in the Kremlin, including the use of preemptive nuclear strikes, as Russian doctrine suggests. In such a case, a Russian leadership would have to consider launching a huge attack in order to neutralize our ICBM force, as well as the other triad legs in our national command and control. Eliminate the 450 ICBMs, and the problem becomes dramatically easier. To succeed, you only need to destroy two submarine bases, two bomber bases, and Washington, and then demand a ceasefire. Even a smaller nuclear power could figure that out. So do we really need to discuss why this is a terrible and dangerous idea? Secondly, removing forces from alert status has been a quest for some people in Washington literally for decades. But they can't tell you why except in the words of this recent study, they believe, and here I quote, that our, that is U.S. ICBM's, quote, rapid reaction posture runs a real risk of accidental or mistaken launch. That, of course, 
is absolutely not true. Then they will tell you that they are worried about the security and safety of Russian ICBMs. But from all the Russians do and say, the Russians aren't worried about that either. Moreover, de-alerting measures are inherently unverifiable. And if you'd like to discuss this at length, we can do so during a Q&A session or just read the piece that I wrote in 2008 for the so-called Perry Schlesinger Commission. And finally, tying a president's hands and making it impossible for the United States to respond for 24 to 72 hours is a perfect formula for a nuclear blackmail scenario, which all of you could conjure up in a few seconds. So keeping a strategic triad, elements of which are always on alert, will remain vital. Additionally, as you will have discerned from my comments about NATO, not only do I believe a strong strategic triad is vital, I believe that we must maintain forward deployed weapons in Europe until our allies tell us they no longer believe those weapons have an important deterrent value. Finally, there is the question of how many warheads we need to maintain in the active force. A few short years ago, make that two years ago, 2010, U.S. Air Force General Chili Chilton, who was at the time testifying on the New START Treaty in his role as then role as Commander U.S. Strategic Command, stated to the Congress that he was, quote, comfortable with the force structure we have, close quote, provided by the New START Treaty, as it is, quote, adequate for the mission that we've been given and is consistent with the nuclear posture review. And that meant a force of about 1,550 deployed warheads, which translates into about 2,200 warheads due to the treaty's counting rules. While additional reductions may in fact be justified depending upon future positive international developments, it should also be clear that radically deep reductions to only a few hundreds of weapons would be wholly inadequate. Such a small force would fall short of all of the requirements of a capable, secure, and reliant deterrent because first, it would not be able to deter direct attack on the U.S., let alone threats to and blackmail of our allies, because it would be too small to threaten retaliation against the most valued assets of a Russia or a China gone bad. And second, the force would be too small to be based survivably and most likely would have to be deployed in a single basing mode rather than a triad. And put another way, this would be susceptible to an enemy preemptive first strike. Finally, and let me close on this point because it's absolutely critical. In thinking about nuclear deterrence, it's vital that we remember that the task is to deter a potentially hostile foreign leadership which possesses nuclear weapons. Our task is not to deter these states today. It is to deter them in a future crisis when they are contemplating the use of military force, possibly including nuclear weapons, against us or our allies' vital interests. In such a perilous policy, I'm sorry, in such a perilous situation, U.S. policy must reflect the fact that we deter hostile leaderships by threatening what they value, not what we value most. We value our people. Hostile authoritarian leaderships value their ability to remain in power, the security apparatus which enables them to do so their military forces and their industrial capacity to sustain war. And so it is a strategic mistake of enormous proportion to believe that an effective deterrent in a future crisis can be based on a few hundred weapons which threaten a potential enemy's cities. That strategy would be both immoral and self-defeating. Mirror imaging is a dangerous and fundamentally flawed approach to deterrence and we must never fall into that trap. With that point made, let me thank you for your time and turn to your questions. The question is, is it a myth that we always have a nuclear-armed aircraft aloft with a pilot wearing an eye patch in case there was a nuclear blast which made him blind in one eye? Yes, it is a myth. Yes, it is a complete myth. Um, see Dr. Strangelove as, uh, you know, as, as an example. The last time the United States had nuclear armed aircraft on airborne alert was in the late 1960s, following 
the accident, I think it was in 67, at, over Palomares, Spain, where, two, where a bomber collided with a tanker and four weapons <laughs> fell to the ground, and one actually had to be recovered from the seabed. The United States took its bombers off of airborne alert. And in 1991, President George H.W. Bush took the bombers off alert, period. So the only forces on alert today are the land-based missiles and those submarines that are at sea. And to address a question you didn't ask, which is what happens if somebody makes a mistake or there's a spark and these things launch inadvertently, the first answer is that that really can't happen. That's been tested. But the, the, the other answer is that the guidance systems of all of the, the, the missiles in peacetime, the submarine launched and the land-based missiles, have been set to a spot in the ocean so that if there was some unbelievable combination of events which led to the inadvertent launch of a missile, it would not fly at some country's landmass. It would just go to the missile. To the missile would, would, would put its warheads in the ocean, and they would not explode. Um, and that, that approach was adopted in the mid-'90s by the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Russia, and China. So the, you, know, you can always worry about things, but that's not one that would keep me up at night. Yes, sir. What would Russia have to do to, uh, to cause me to believe that they've reassessed their policy goals? The first thing they would have to do is to change their public military doctrine and to stop saying that NATO is an enemy. They would have to stop holding exercises where they clearly simulate the use of nuclear weapons against Poland or the Baltic states and make that fact known, because today they make the fact known that they do have those exercises. Um, they would need to refrain from making the kinds of statements that I quoted. You know, if an American president or a secretary of defense or chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, yeah, we could use our nuclear weapons preemptively if the Russians do this or that, that individual be fired the next day, the president would be impeached. These kinds of quotes are routinely appearing in the press from both Putin and Medvedev and now Putin again. So this kind of public rhetoric and, and real policy has to change. It has to change permanently and for the better. And the Chinese, on the other hand, need to become transparent. Now, it is said that the Chinese believe that transparency is a sign of weakness. I hope that that's not true. But the notion that they simply will not discuss why they continue to build nuclear forces, why they won't engage in any dialogue with us on this issue, is in fact, I think, an, an unsettling uh, situation. We need the dialogue. We need the transparency. The best thing about the New START Treaty was that we once again had Russian inspectors on American soil and American inspectors on Russian soil, because transparency leads to predictability, and predictability leads to increased stability, and that's a good thing. But with those dialogues cut off, we can't tell. Uh, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a short answer. Yes, sir. The question is, does the administration plan to eliminate the B-52 as a nuclear weapons delivery platform? And if it does, what does it plan to use to replace it? And the, I don't know the answer to that question because the administration has for two plus years refused to tell the Congress what the force structure is going to look like uh, when the new START treaty is fully in place. And so questions that are hanging fire are what's the future of the Minuteman force? We've been studying that without making decisions. Are we going to buy a new long-range air launch cruise missile to replace the one that was built in built and deployed in 1980? Uh, and therefore, will we be able to have the B-52 remain in a nuclear role? But the administration has steadfastly refused to supply the Congress with any clarity on that issue. So it would be good to have some transparency here at home as well. Yes, ma'am. The question, if I can encapsulate it, is because the U.S. government is broke, how can it continue to maintain nuclear forces as well as conventional defense capabilities? Is that, is that fair? And my answer is the government isn't broke. The government is playing financial games. The Congress and the President cannot get together to come up with a solution which is easily with, within their grasp should they grasp the nettle and go back and read Kennedy's book, Profiles and Courage, the lack of which is, is evident in Washington today in both parties. So we're not broke. Now the question will be, 
what kind of a defensive cap capacity do we need for the future? And yes, we need special forces, and yes, we need, um, we need conventional forces, and yes, we need cyber forces, and yes, we will need nuclear forces. If the administration would say what the nuclear force is supposed to be, there could be a debate on that subject, but they have not. So that question remains hanging, and with any luck, we will learn after the election, regardless of who's elected, what the plans are for a future uh, nuclear force. The question concerns an Iranian nuclear capacity um, and saying that if things continue on their current course, Iran will have a nuclear weapon, and then what's our plan? I'm going to disappoint you. I'm going to disappoint you because I'm going to tell you that I do not believe there's anything we can do to stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon. The only thing we can do to stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon is to take over the country, and we're not going to do that. So we will have to learn to live with an Iranian nuclear weapon. And, and, and the next question is, well, how do you deter these, these crazy people who believe in the 12th Imam and all the rest? And while analogies prove nothing, let me roll the clock back to the 1960s, where there was a country that you all remember, capital R, capital C, Red China, you know, headed by Mao Zedong, who was a dedicated revolutionary, who was a global revolutionary, who was about to plunge his country into the cultural revolution and create enormous chaos, and he developed a nuclear weapons capability. And since the 1960s, the Chinese government in the area of nuclear weapons policy has been extremely restrained. And because the Chinese government recognizes that there is a U.S. deterrent, it has not threatened nuclear weapons use against its neighbors. It has been a responsible actor. And I believe the same thing will occur with Iran. Do I want to have to end up deterring Iran? No. Do I think we're going to have to end up doing so? Yes. And whatever one thinks of the supreme leader and, and, and the elected governments, they're not about to end 20 centuries of Persian culture with rash military acts. So while I'm not comfortable with that, I don't think there's anything we can do except to have a viable deterrent capacity to protect our interests and those of our allies and friends in the region. And I think as well, and this is a very unpopular thing to say, that we're going to have to think about finding a way to extend a deterrent, nuclear deterrent umbrella over some of the Gulf states and maybe Saudi Arabia as well, unless we want them to go off and build their own weapons. Now, I, for one, would rather not have them go off and build their own weapons. You're deal talking about cultures that, that, that have fundamentally different outlooks for the people sitting in this room. And yet, when you have to balance a series of bad outcomes, I think having all of those states with nuclear weapons, because Iran has a nuclear weapon, is probably the worst of all outcomes, because someday somebody's going to be stupid enough to use one. How does Israel fit into the equation? How does Israel fit into the equation? Israel has its own nuclear capability. Israel doesn't need us to put a nuclear umbrella over them, nor would the Israelis trust us to put a nuclear umbrella over them. That's the history of the state of Israel. The Israelis have the capacity to reduce Persian civilization to smoking ruins. And the supreme leaders and the ayatollahs and the elected president, however crazy he may be, recognize that fact. So I think there's absolutely no reason why nuclear deterrence cannot operate at that level. Will it stop them from continuing to use surrogates to, to conduct acts of terror? No. You've got to do that with other means. But as far as using a nuclear weapon, yeah, I think that's deterrable. Not optimal, but deterrable. Yes, ma'am. The question was, given my remarks in favor of transparency, um, how do I explain the fact that Israel is not transparent about its nuclear program? The U.S. government supports that stance. I support transparency. As I said before, I think transparency leads to predictability, and that leads to increased stability. So I think there should be transparency. The question was, can nuclear deterrence be applied to the current crises, Arab Spring or Afghanistan? The answer is no, absolutely not. I mean, with the Arab Spring, you have a political movement um, which is different from country to country, which we barely understand. Uh, we don't understand the dynamics. We barely know who the leaders of some of the 
of the uh, the factions are. Um, that's a that's a problem for diplomacy, until and unless one of those states begins attacking American interests, at which point it shifts over to to a potentially military solution with conventional forces. In Afghanistan, how do you then allocate funds or resource limited funds where predator drones, special forces equipment, etc., are essential right now and are hurting for resources, and yet there are funds that you're you're asking to be acquired to maintain a conventional deterrent. Well, if we could only deter one threat in the world, then we're in pretty sad shape. If you look at the size of the Department of Defense op budget, you look at the size of the armed forces we have, I believe that we need to do a fundamental relook at the size and composition of some of our force structure. Certain things we're going to need because of the continued terrorist activities around the world, we are going to need drones, we're going to need special operation forces, that's a given. That doesn't mean you can't have conventional ships, it doesn't mean you can't have armored divisions, it doesn't mean you can't have fighters and tankers, and it doesn't mean you can't have a nuclear modernization program which can be stretched out over 20 years. But you have to say what that modernization program is going to be so that you can begin to budget for it. Uh, something I didn't mention, and, and thank you, no one's picked me up on it yet, um, is, is, is the nuclear weapons infrastructure, which is aging, uh, which is uh, sort of a, you know, you go into any of the particular nuclear laboratories and it either looks like the 1950s or the 1970s, but, but the ceilings are falling in and there are nets uh, at Oak Ridge that, that catch chunks of concrete from falling down. And that whole infrastructure needs a complete overhaul. And, and, and after 30 years of experimenting with whether the Department of Energy can can look after the nuclear weapons uh, complex, I think it's time to make some major and significant changes in that as well. But I think it, it, as I said earlier, it is an absolutely false situation to say, well, if it didn't stop 9-11, therefore you don't need it. I mean, you have to deal with, with, with preventing big wars, and then you worry about little wars. But it's not like these are events which occur either or. The United States is a global power. It is still the preeminent global power, and there are, there are tens of countries which depend on us to maintain their security. And because we do that, they don't build their own nuclear weapons, and because we have a global presence, they don't go pick fights with one another uh, the, way, the way they did before 1945. So setting up that kind of either-or uh, uh, question, I think, is, is just a false choice. Yes, sir. The question was, do we have a missile defense system today? And if we do, how viable is it? And, and you know, the, the, the smart answer is against what? Uh, yes, we have a, a missile defense system which is deployed. We have a small number of, of interceptors deployed on the West Coast uh, designed to intercept um, fairly unsophisticated rockets from North Korea. Um, the goal of a missile defense which could provide um, an astrodome, if you will, excuse the, the, the expression, against all ballistic missile threats, including from sophisticated countries, is something the United States has chased for decades. And, and you saw it again in the 1980s in President Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative. But technology always seems to favor the offense. So you're not going to have a ballistic missile defense which would protect you from a Russia or a China. It can protect you against rudimentary threats. We ha are working, we have deployed the first elements of a theater missile defense which could protect our deployed forces and some of our allies against short range missiles and those defenses are both land based army systems and sea based uh, systems on, on our destroyers and cruisers. But again, those are against a very limited series of threats, not long-range threats to the United States. The question is, what, what nation do I consider transparent because the questioner is, is not aware of any? Um, that may be a relative question. But it is but, a relative term. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I think it is a relative term. I think the United States is a transparent government. Transparent Some things, relative, no, term. if you say, if you want to say, is, 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 does, by transparency, is everything open to the public? The answer is no. There are clearly areas in our government and in governments around the world 
that are classified and, they're not, and they're, are not open to scrutiny by the average citizen. But Although they, well, excuse me, I'm trying to answer the question, okay? <laughs> so those elements of the United States in, in most parts of our national policies, whether at the state level, the, f the federal level, or the local level, is transparent. Citizens are aware of what their government is doing and what their money is being spent for. For those parts of the federal budget, which are not transparent, there are elected representatives of the people in the Senate and the House who have access and therefore through representation in what is a republic, not an open democracy, because that's the way the framers constructed our government, representatives of the people are aware of what's going on. I would say to you that in the United Kingdom that situation exists. I would say it, say again, it exists in France. It does not exist in authoritarian regimes. There is no transparency in Russia. There is no transparency in China. And we could go through the 100 or the 200 odd countries in the world and list them. But what I'm talking about is trans, what I meant in my remarks was transparency from one government to another. If you want to learn about what U.S. nuclear forces, uh, how they're deployed, what money is being spent, what the basic policy deterrence is, you don't need to listen to me. You can find it on the net. You can find it in reports of the Secretary of Defense. You can't find these things for most countries in the world as to what their defense establishments look like and what they're buying and what they're doing. So yes, I believe we have a transparent system. The question was whether or not we are able to deter terrorist use of a nuclear weapon. But you, you, muddy, you cleverly muddied the waters there. <laughs> you started out talking about terrorist use, and then you made it the use of a nuclear weapon supplied by a state actor to a non-state actor. Okay? So I'm absolutely in agreement with you that if a state actor seeks to use a nuclear weapon uh, in anger, that, that there are sanctions against it and that retaliation is, is clearly uh, an option and, and, and will undoubtedly follow. The, the point I was making is that s deterrence applies to holding at risk what enemy leaders value. That tends to be territory or people or shrines you fill in the blank. Stateless actors don't have things that you can hold at risk that way. If you're dealing with terrorists, you can either reform them or kill them. And a nuclear weapon is not part of that equation. So again, if you're talking about an Al-Qaeda-like organization that steals one and tries to use it on its own, a nuclear deterrence is not the answer. The answer is special forces and intelligence and and intercepting the, the whatever it is, Dow, uh, airplane, uh, rusty hulk freighter that's carrying the weapon before it gets to our shores. If you're talking about a government that as a matter of state policy is working with a terrorist to try to, to, to get a nuclear weapon smuggled to our shores, then it's an entirely different situation. You're back to a state actor and you're back to a place where nuclear deterrence actually plays a role. Uh, the question is, is, is essentially, is a, is, is a Hitler type individual deterrable? Um, you know, there is, there, is no, there is no certain answer to your question, but, uh, but a Mao Zedong did not try to take major military action against the United States, Japan, or Taiwan. Um, Hitler did not use chemical weapons because he'd been gassed in World War I and because he knew the Allies had retaliatory chemical weapon capability. Saddam Hussein did not use weapons of mass destruction in, in, in the first Gulf War, and he had rudimentary uh, chemical and biological weapons in the second Gulf War and did not use those. So you can pile up a series of historical examples which suggest that so-called crazy people can, in fact, be deterred by the consequences. There's no ironclad answer to that. Each actor is going to be unique and sui generis. But you wouldn't call them humanitarian. Say again? Yeah. You wouldn't call them humanitarian. No, I would not. No. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Would I comment on the instability of Pakistan? If I were in government today, that would keep me up. 
I think the, the Indian, Pakistan, the, the, the South Asian subcontinent is probably the most dangerous place on earth. Um, part of that we brought on ourselves through well-intended but badly thought out policies. So, so after Pakistan developed a nuclear weapon in the 70s, because of an amendment introduced by Senator Pressler, we cut off all military contacts with Pakistan. And the fact of the matter is that we do not know the current generation of Pakistani generals. We do not, we have no contact with uh, lieutenants and captains and, and, and majors and, and colonels who are the next generation. So we don't know who these people are. We have to worry that there is a, an active insurgency in the northwest provinces, which a couple of years ago got within a couple of tens of miles of Islamabad. We don't know who's vetting the guys who guard Pakistan's nuclear weapons and how many of them may or may not be sleeper agents. We know that there is a deep-seated hatred between India and Pakistan. We know that the Pakistanis have developed short-range nuclear weapons to defeat the next Indian attack whenever it's coming, and they provoked that attack by, by doing terrorist raids like the one in Mumbai a couple of years ago. So this is an area of the world that, that worries me a great deal, and that I hope that, that those who came behind me in government are, are working to deal with. But this is probably one of the hardest problems we face, and one where we have the fewest tools available to actually shape the outcome, at least for the, you know, the next five years. The question is, aren't we financing uh, a great deal in Pakistan? And the answer is, when you get an army in a landlocked country, you got to resupply that army. You got to find ways to do it. So the answer to your question is, yeah, there's a lot of U.S. money going to Pakistan, and the sooner we get out of Afghanistan, the better, and that can end. Question was was did, did what, essentially what role did the United States government play in the immediate post-Soviet period when Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus um, gave up their nuclear weapons? And a sort of a follow-on question was how did Russia become more powerful? Uh, yes, the United States government was extraordinarily active diplomatically in working with um, the successor states to the Soviet Union to ensure that only one country emerged as a nuclear weapon state. And while we did not pay hard currency um, for those weapons, we engaged in a whole series of cooperative efforts um, which were essentially birthed by Senators uh, uh, Sam Nunn and, and Dick Lugar, uh, which, which emerged into something called the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Uh, which worked with those countries to dismantle the nuclear legacy of the Soviet Union and brought them into the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty as non-nuclear states. Um, I would not say that, the, that Russia is so powerful. What I hope to convey tonight is that Russia maintains a fairly strong attachment to its nuclear weapons and that it maintains a fairly active building program and that when it thinks it can get away with it, it uses those, those weapons to intimidate its near neighbors. Uh, I don't think that any Russian leader in his or maybe someday her right mind would, would initiate military action against NATO or the United States if we maintain our defensive capacities. Um, and indeed, the Russian conventional forces are much weaker than those of the Red Army, than those of the Soviet Union. Although if you look um, at Ossetia in Georgia, those forces were surely strong enough to do a land grab and to continue to occupy that land. And that's why our allies in the Baltics and in Poland uh, worry about not full-scale invasions, but, but land grabs with, with the forces that the Russians still have. The question was, if President Kennedy had not forced the Russian Soviet missiles out of Cuba in 1962, how would it have played out? I, I have absolutely no answer for that. I, you know, I, I have absolutely no answer for that. I mean, it's a contrary to fact condition. Kennedy was not going to allow that to happen. So, so imagining how it could have happened, one, one doesn't know. I mean, if you, if, 
if you want to get into speculative what ifs and, and how how might it have been, you need to understand that, and you do, I don't mean to be patronizing, one needs to understand that Khrushchev put the weapons into Cuba because he lacked the capacity to threaten the United States with from the Russian uh, homeland and because he was under pressure from the East German leadership and from some hardliners within the Politburo to move on Berlin. Now, what he believed was having unveiled this capacity to, to hit the United States at very short notice, that he could then move on Berlin and we would, we would be checkmated. You know, that didn't happen. No. Um, what would have happened had he done it, put the weapons in? I don't, I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, is what's the cost of our nuclear deterrent? And, and the second question is, how much is enough? And what I said, how much is enough is what is necessary to hold at risk what a potentially hostile Russian or Chinese leadership might value. And I quoted the commander's strategic command saying that he was comfortable with the numbers allowed under the New START Treaty in 2010, which is 1550 or 2200, depending on how you look at it. Um, you know, the cost question is, is something that you need to approach very carefully. There's a, there's a group in Washington called Plowshares Fund, which I think is now throwing around a number of $660 billion over the next 10 years to maintain the deterrent. Well, okay, so if you're going to start counting the cost of the pay and allowances and retirement and health care costs of all the kids in the ICBM force and all the guys who run SSBNs and all the bomber pilots, I mean, you, you can build any number you want. Um, the cost of a new Trident submarine, which is not moving forward yet, which will, I think, the first one will deploy in 2029, is, is, I think it's $7 billion for the first ship and $4 billion thereafter because of learning curves and research and development and upfront costs. Um, if we build a new bomber, we will build a new bomber for conventional purposes and the nuclear add-on will be 3% of what that cost will be. Um, the, the Trident II sea launch ballistic missile is in fact a real bargain. Uh, that was a system that was deployed in, first deployed in 1989, and through a series of life extension programs, the Navy is going to keep that missile operational until 2060. So, um, you know, there are various ways of slicing this. How many new ICBMs are you going to buy? Are you going to buy 450? Are you going to buy 300? Are you going to buy some number in between? Is it an all new missile, or are you simply going to do continued? Um, um, upgrades of, of key components which are aging. Um, you know, if, 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 if you really want me to shock you and send you away feeling sad, the, the cost that the nuclear laboratories came up with to replace the bomb that we have deployed in Europe is between six and ten billion dollars. It's because they turned it into a science project as opposed to simply doing what needed to be done. And that is what one of the things that's behind my remarks saying the whole nuclear weapons establishment infrastructure under DOE has proved a complete and abject failure and needs to be dramatically revised so that the taxpayer gets value and, and um, uh, we don't have situations like that. So there's no good answer to your question. It's a great question. And, and everybody's got their own answer. And, 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 and if I were in my, you know, if I were, if I were still in government, I would ask you what the cost is of deterring a nuclear attack, too. But I didn't. <laughs> yes, sir. The question was, does North Korea, North Korea announced 24, within the last 24 hours, that it has missiles capable of reaching the United States. Um, and I could announce to you that I'm 7-1 and I can actually dunk. <laughs> uh, no. No. The, the, the North Koreans have, have tried to fly an intercontinental range missile three times over the last 10 years, and each one has failed. So, no. I mean, I, someday maybe, but not now and not for a long time. 
And again, we have, we have the missile, de I mean, for those kinds of threats, the missile defense system as now deployed is going to be capable. So no, that doesn't, that does not bother me. The question was, um, could a nuclear weapon be deployed, could be used, could a nuclear weapon be used to create an electromagnetic pulse which, which theoretically can disable um, military and, and civilian electronics across a wide spectrum of territory. Um, the first thing I would say to you, which is completely off subject, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it, is that we use our nuclear weapons every day. They're war prevention tools, and we use them every day. They are war prevention tools, and they are used every day. Using a nuclear weapon doesn't mean blowing it up. It is a tool of war prevention, and that is why we have them today. With respect to electromagnetic pulses, clearly you can create, using non-nuclear means, a strong burst of electrical energy, but, but because it's not going to be up at height, you're not going to have a, a fair amount of, of geographical coverage. Electromagnetic pulse is not a new phenomenon. <coughs> when I was deeply involved in the business, the creation of electromagnetic pulse effects was, was uncertain at best. Um, the notion that you would use that as a weapon strikes me as highly unlikely and illogical because it could not only affect your potential enemy, but it could affect you. And at the end of the day, no matter how they try to dress up the fact that it didn't destroy anything on the ground, it's the use of a nuclear weapon. I mean, you're blowing something up. Right. You're blowing up a nuclear weapon. That crosses the nuclear threshold for the first time since 1945. So I read about those threats, but I tend to discount them both because of the severity of what would happen across the nuclear threshold and the low probability, the low return on investment having done it. How is cyber warfare going to affect the command and control systems of the United States? The answer is if we do it right, not at all. I mean, the, the command, nuclear command and control system has always been, uh, I think the technical term is air-gapped. It's been completely removed from any other uh, a national communication system precisely so that if somebody intruded into one system, they couldn't get to the nuclear system. Um, if, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't legislate against stupidity, but <laughs> if we were to take the nuclear command and control system and somehow make it web-based, even web-based within a DOD air gap, you're going to introduce, in my judgment, a lot of, a lot of concerns um, about reliability, but I'm hoping we're not going to do that. Thank you all very much.